Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the Friendship Sunday School class of TAP Methodist Church here in New Boston, Texas. My name is Tim Graham, and today we're going to be in lesson number three of a, a series we call Mentoring. And today we're going to be talking about Eli and Samuel and uh, their relationship and how exactly Samuel came to hear from the Lord based on Eli's guidance. Really good story about a uh, an older priest and a, a younger man that has just come into the service of the temple. Uh, because his mom, Hannah, dedicated him uh, to a life as such when uh, when God blessed her with the son. Uh, a few things we need to pray for this morning. Uh, pray for Let's uh, continue to pray for Colby Towns. Maggie Snyder and Kim Taylor are still in need of a kidney transplant. Uh, Dick King was hospitalized for a brief time uh, last week from uh, Monday through Thursday, but he got to come home. So many thanks for uh, for that. He's going to a doctor's appointment next week to find out exactly uh, what's wrong and what they can do to uh, to heal him. Uh, but continue to pray for uh, for Dick and Linda as uh, Dick continues to get well. A blessing yesterday. Uh, we had a couple of storms that rolled through New Boston and uh, blew over some trees and started some fires. But uh, but thankfully the the fire department was Johnny on the spot and uh, able to get the the fire extinguished and uh, houses were saved, lives were saved. I mean, it was really a, a great day yesterday by the first responders in the fire department. So we'd like to uh, thank them for coming to the rescue um, of many people here in town and especially a, a family here at the church. But anyway, we're we're thankful for them and the, and the services uh, that they provide. If you've got a prayer concern that you'd like to lift up, you can list it here in the comments section and uh, we can pray for them corporately. Uh, but if you've got your Bibles handy and you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. And one night, Eli's, uh, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of the God was. And then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you call me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. And again, the Lord called, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you call me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel a third time. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you call me. And then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever. Because of the sin he knew about, his sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened up the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him, 
And then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we're thankful we live in a free country where we can come and worship and study your word and and uh, find information in the Bible to uh, to show your mercy, to show your character, to show exactly how you deal with, with sinners and with saints. And Lord, we're thankful this morning for the blessings that we receive on a daily basis that we don't recognize, Lord. And we're thankful for the blessings that we do see, where we see your mighty hand at work, whether it be in healing uh, people or whether it be in rescuing your saints. We thank you for your goodness. And Lord, we'd ask that you be with us here today as we pour over your word, that you would help us to understand what you were trying to say, that even though back in Samuel and Eli's days, your voice was rare to be heard. Lord, let us listen just like Eli, or Samuel did as he lay down at night, as he uh, was gathering his thoughts from the day and concentrating solely on you, Lord. May we do the same. May we hear your still, quiet voice and obey. All these things we'll ask in your name. Amen. This is uh, <clears throat> the first lesson that we, uh, first two lessons that we did had to had to deal with Moses. Uh, you know, and the, uh, uh, the, the last one, the one that we did last week was a relationship between Moses and Joshua and the one the first week between Moses and Jethro, his father-in-law. So it was kind of a family relationship with, with those two, uh, because it had been around, uh, one another quite some time. But in the story today, we find that Eli, who is a, a priest at the temple, uh, has, gained the scorn of God. And uh, unbeknownst to him, there's a woman named Hannah that has been praying for a son. And uh, she has promised that if uh, she is given a son, that he will, she will turn him over to the work of the temple, that she will dedicate him uh, to God. And true to form, God comes through. And Hannah goes to Eli and says, look, I've got a son and this is the deal I made with God. And I want him to come into service of the temple. And Eli takes him in in his older age. When Samuel comes to temple, he's only about 12 or 13 years old. So he's still very young. But the way that they got here was God pronounced his judgment on Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who had been outright rebellious. They had not obeyed the laws of God. They had not obeyed the laws of temple. And Eli did nothing to keep them in check. He did not discipline his sons. He did not condone their sins. He let them run amok in the temple. And for his sin, God pronounced judgment on both his sons and on Eli. He said Eli would not, uh, he would not allow Eli's sons to, to do, any, uh, uh, do any further service in the temple. As a matter of fact, he tells them that he's going to kill them on the same day. And later on in the story, we find out that's true, but, but Eli had to find someone to carry on his duties and Hannah dedicated her son Samuel to do such. And this is where we pick up the story is where Samuel is in the service of Eli and uh, they're just beginning to hear God's voice. They, they don't know what it sounds like because God has given them the silent treatment for so long. He's not speaking to any kings. He's not speaking to any judges. He's not speaking to any prophets. He's not speaking to anybody. He's quiet. And it's really kind of a unique time in the, with the Israelite people because God is not speaking to them. He's not giving them any direction. He's not telling them anything. But this is all about to change with the anointing of Samuel as God has chosen him to deliver the message to Eli. As Hannah promised, she takes Samuel, while he's still young, to live and work at the worship center with Eli. Eli will finish raising him, though Hannah and her husband are going to visit very often. But Samuel tells this to Eli, who replies with faith, He is the Lord, and he will do what is right. When Samuel relays what God told him. 
Now, God may not speak to us in an audible voice, but he speaks through the Bible and he speaks through the Holy Spirit within us. His voice is recognizable. It's the one forever encouraging us toward goodness. Where are we in the story of the Bible? What has come before? What do we know about the rest of the life of Samuel? Well, the the thing we first find out, out about Eli. Eli has probably gained a little bit of wisdom uh, looking at his sons and what their uh, lawless and and unchecked behavior did, uh, that God exercised, God pronounced judgment on his family and on the sins of his sons. And Eli's probably regretting that he did not keep his sons in check. He's wishing he probably exercised a little more guardianship over his sons. So now that he's got a new chance, a new lease on life with Samuel, he's probably going to raise him in the temple a little bit different. He's going to teach Samuel reverence. He's going to teach him respect for God. He's going to teach him to obey all the laws. Now, now you would think that this far along in the story of the Israelites, that they would recognize that God, when he says uh, what he says, what he means, he means what he says. When he gives them commandments, he wants them to abide by the commandments. When he gives them instruction on how to bring forth water from a rock, he expects them to follow that to the T. And when they don't, like Moses did, the, the littlest of sins, the l- smallest of indiscretions can keep you from major blessings. So you would think, that Eli would have watched over his sons just a little more closely, but he didn't. The spoken word of God came to Abraham, that came to Moses and the Israelites and Joshua, but it was rare during this time that it would come to the people. But to Eli, God sent a message of judgment, not directly to him, but through a man of God who was willing to listen and deliver God's warning, neither Eli nor Samuel had yet experienced hearing the voice of God at the time when God spoke to Samuel. But how fearful of this must have been for Samuel as he's sitting there listening to the judgment that God is going to pronounce on his mentor. And he's like, oh man, I, I really don't want to tell him this. I really don't want to tell him that. But Eli gives him some valuable instruction when he says, don't you hold anything back from me about what he said or lest it happen to you. So there's the threat. Don't mistake uh, God's talking to you that you can hold anything back from me. You've got to tell me everything and you've got to tell it exactly as God related to it. And if you don't, Bad things are going to befall you just like they befell me and my family. Samuel is 12 years old at this time. He's a teenager and he was a young man and he had ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And this is kind of an incredible story because it tells us that Eli's health is failing. Can you imagine as a 12 year old going in to tell your mentor what is fixing to happen to you and your family? This must have been real tough for Samuel, but it lets us know that God chose the right person to come in and succeed Eli, that he was not going to back down from telling the people everything that God told him. Now, here's, here's another interesting part about where was Samuel when God was talking to him. Well, it says that Eli laid down in his normal place, but Samuel was in the temple where the ark of God was. Why wasn't Eli laying down where the ark of God was? I don't know. We can't answer that question. Maybe there's only supposed to be one person at the time, but but Samuel was given that responsibility. The different locations for the characters are significant. While we're not told exactly where Eli's usual sleeping place was, it is clear that it was not in the temple itself. Samuel's choice to camp out in the temple underscores his dedication to God and contrasts Eli's apathetic and indifferent attitude toward holy things. Samuel respected the items of the temple and he acted as such. So he's in the temple when, when God calls out to him right before daybreak. 
He's still there. He's slept there all night. And uh, God is moving from the use of the judge and priest to the use of the prophet. So he's not talking to the judges anymore. He's going to the prophet and the prophet would become the spokesman to and for the king. So this is kind of the, the shape of things to come. And we find out later uh, that when Nathan, the prophet addressed David, he wasn't really speaking to David. He was speaking to David through Nathan. So we find out that this here early on in Eli and Samuel, that the prophets are going to play a more significant part in the history of Israel, okay? Because they're the ones that are going to speak to the people. It's no longer through the judges and the kings. It's going to be through the prophets. And, and I can see that, okay? Because the prophets, they might not be as fearful as telling the king or, or telling a court what's going to happen. Whereas if a king gets the message directly to himself, he may not feel compelled to tell everybody. He may not, he may hold some things back. But these prophets, following uh, Samuel's example, would begin to tell everything that God said. They didn't hold anything back. And that benefited the king and it benefited the people of Israel much more when they found out the full statement of God. What do you, what do we learn about God from this story that he's, that he's chosen Samuel to speak to Eli? People are meant to live in an ongoing conversation with God, speaking and being spoken to by him. God's visit to Adam and Eve in the garden, the face-to-face -face conversations between Moses and God are all commonly regarded as highly exceptional moments in the religious history of mankind. But in truth, we talk to God every day through prayer. He may answer, not in an audible way, or he may not answer. But that is a way that we learn to be in conversation with God and where we can recognize his voice. It's kind of amazing to me. I got a phone call this past week from a guy that I probably haven't heard from in, in five or six years. And I immediately recognized his voice when I picked up the phone. And it was a number that I, that I did not recognize. But he was kind of surprised that I recognized his voice. And I told him, hey, I'd, I'd recognize that voice anywhere. Well, that's the way it is with us. If we speak to God on a constant basis, we recognize when he's working in our lives, audibly or inaudibly, silent as he may seem to us, we can recognize that if we pray to him, if we talk to him in an ongoing conversation. Tell God what truths you must need to hear from him regularly. Even throughout the Bible, there were certain times when, when people that, when God was talking to certain people, Gabriel for one says, well, if what you're telling me is true, I'm going to lay this blanket down on the ground tonight. And if, if what you said is true, it's going to be wet on the top or it's going to be wet on the bottom. He tested him twice and specifically asked him to, to do two things. And maybe that's what we can do. God, God, show me a sign. Show me a sign. Bring me someone that can affirm what you're telling me. And that's exactly what Eli asked Samuel. He said, look, you're in conversation with God you tell me what he's telling you. And that way we've got a circle of friends. We've got a group of friends that if we're hearing this, if they're hearing the same message about us that we're hearing about us, that only affirms what God is trying to tell us. And we learn about hearing from God in, in Samuel's example, when Eli told him to go back to bed and say, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. This time when Samuel heard his name, instead of going to Eli, he said, speak for your servant is listening. Samuel learned to listen for God's voice and obey God. And I can't imagine how terrifying it must have been for Samuel to hear that because he's supposed to be alone in temple. He's in there with the Ark of the Covenant and he hears someone else's voice. And he, the only one that he reasons that it could be is Eli. And I know it doesn't sound like Eli, but it must have, you know, woke him up and he's just, he, he can't figure out who else to go to because he and Eli are the only two in temple. 
And fortunately for Samuel, Eli realizes, hey, God is trying to talk to him. God is trying to reveal himself to him. He needs to go back there and listen. He doesn't say anything else but speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. He didn't go get Eli up a fourth time and said, hey, 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 I heard the voice again. You come in here and you tell me what he's going to say to me. No, no. Eli gave him the advice, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, because Eli didn't know if God wanted anybody else to hear that message, but Samuel needed to be there alone because Eli didn't hear the voice. It was only Samuel. Well, what application do we find in this story for us in modern day? Eli's guidance was instructive. It said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. A servant is humble and ready to carry out the master's instruction. Say, for example, that a a cranky neighbor leaves an irritable voicemail for you and you're tempted to hold a grudge, but then the word of the Lord speaks and says, love your neighbor. You're tempted to spend your work bonus on a luxury vacation, and then the word of the Lord comes to you and says, store up for yourself treasure in heaven. You're on a crowded expressway during rush hour when someone wants to pull in front of you and you're tempted to respond, get behind me, Satan. (laughs) But instead you hear the voice of God and you do to others what what you would have them do to you. It's the voice of God that we hear by reading the Bible, the scriptures that we recite, the words that we study that change our heart and that come to mind when we go through certain issues like this and in modern day in our everyday lives, that we, instead of anger, we look to be a servant. Instead of being disrespected, we look to turn the other cheek. But you only do that by hearing the word of God. And we do that by going to Sunday school and talking in small groups and going to Bible studies And the last thing, the the least important thing is going to church because that's when you hear and there's really no time for interaction. But in small group and Bible study, there's time for interaction. There's time for questions. There's time for deeper study. But most people have it confused today and they, they think they hear the voice of God in corporate worship. And you may hear it in corporate worship, but in smaller groups and in individual prayer time, that's where you're really going to hear the word of God speak to you, much like what Samuel did in the verses today. And, uh, and, and God and Jesus both refer to the shepherd, know my voice. They know what I sound like. I already related that earlier when, when an individual called me last week and I, I knew immediately who he was. The main way we learn to recognize God's voice is in situations where we're not sure what to do is by obeying him in situations where his will is clear. We learn to recognize someone's voice by experience. It's a learned skill and it's something we're able to do, even though we might not be able to describe how we've done it. And, and I realized that, you know, over the past couple of years and months that, that people have have grown accustomed to hearing a shepherd's voice, but the shepherd was not in close contact with God. And the shepherd led them astray, led them to believe other things. But they had got so accustomed to hearing the shepherd's voice, they didn't question. They just kept following the shepherd. And they weren't able to recognize when the shepherd got so far off track, got so far off base, got so far away from the word of God, they didn't recognize. Why? Because they hadn't been reading the word of God. They hadn't been studying the word of God, they hadn't been participating in Bible study or, or small groups or Sunday school. And they kept listening to the, to the shepherd until they got so far away that they started to question things. And they started to turn back to the Bible and realize that the shepherd had led them into a dangerous place. And they broke. They broke free on their own and, and had to turn to, back to God and find out where they were headed. They had to break away from the false prophet. They had to break away from the shepherd that wasn't listening to God's voice anymore, much like Eli's sons. Their lawless and reckless behavior cost them their lives. 
their disobedience to their dad cost Eli his position in the temple. Why didn't Eli discipline his sons? Can't answer that question. I don't know. Because I would be certain that if my boys were doing something that were detrimental to their health or to their future or something that would destroy their careers, I would like to think that I would step up to the plate and say, hey, you need to change the way you're doing things. This is not what God intended for your life. You're, you're not going to fulfill or live up to all the blessings that God has intended for you if you keep going down this same path because he's not going to protect you. He's going to pull his protection from you and he may even cast judgment on you. So you need to turn around. I do not know why Eli did not have that conversation with his sons, but it cost him dearly. And it's cost us dearly uh, as well when we listen to false prophets, when we don't obey what God's saying. It cost us dearly too. So maybe it's time for us to be like Samuel, where we listen to the one true shepherd, that we don't get tied up in a personality, that we don't get tied up in a charismatic individual that we listen to the word of God and we obey what it says. Can you describe a time when you heard the voice of God? The writings of great Christians of the past, such as John Calvin, William Law, uh, John Wesley, help us to identify experiences of God speaking, just like Eli helped Samuel. Well, is hearing from God a part of normal Christian life? Absolutely it is. Some would say that, that it's a presumptuous and even dangerous idea, but should we expect anything else? Given the words of Scripture and the heritage of the Christian church, as Christians, we stand in a millennia-long tradition of humans who have been addressed by God. So I would answer that absolutely we're going to hear from God. There was a lot more communication when Jesus walked the earth between he and God than any other person that's walked the earth. Jesus communed with him on a daily basis, talking to him, visiting with him, and, and having different prophets come down and appear to the disciples. So yes, we should hear from God all the time because he wants this Christianity thing to succeed. He's going to talk to different individuals. He's going to coach the prophets. He's going to coach the disciples. He's going to coach the ones that are trying to continue this. Much like Paul and much like Peter and much like the early disciples, he wanted to make sure this thing was going to be a success. So absolutely he was conversing with them. He was uh, appearing before them in empty rooms and on the shores of the lakes where they were fishing. Of course he was counseling them. So why should we expect anything different today? We shouldn't. We should expect the same, that we should have conversations with God as well. The spirit who inhabits us is not mute. Restricting himself to an occasional nudge or a brilliant image or a case of goosebumps. The spirit that lives within us can only repeat what God tells him. Much like what Samuel and Eli, the relationship that they had, Samuel was bound to tell Eli everything that God had said, and so is the Holy Spirit. He is bound by God to tell us everything that God wants us to hear. So when you hear the Holy Spirit talking to you, it's through God. It's from the mouth of God. And we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is talking like, like that to us today. Is it possible that God is speaking and we don't hear? Absolutely. Absolutely, especially in today's world. When we are so busy with everything else, when we are multitasking with everything that we do. Because how many of us don't get in a vehicle today and, and call it window time that we're not on the phone doing something? Whether it's researching a website, whether it's answering an email, where it's making a phone call, returning a text. We're always doing something else while we're driving. And so why do you think that wrecks have escalated? Because we're distracted. We're distracted. I can't go up and down Interstate 30 on any given day during the week and not have an accident in slow traffic. Why? Because there's construction going on and people 
are not paying attention. Well, are we not paying attention to God either? Are we not talking with him? No, we're not talking with him. There's too many distractions. We've got too many other things to do. We've got baseball games to attend. We've got softball games to attend. We've got family reunions to go to. We've got barbecues to go to. We've got birthdays and vacations and uh, everything like that. Everything distracts us from worshiping God and studying the Bible and finding out what he wants us to hear. We may not recognize it because those most adept at the divine human conversation are often more reluctant to speak about the inner voice in contrast to those who have some of the more spectacular experiences. It is not for show and tell any more than intermittent interchanges between two people generally are. When you've got Christian brothers that meet and share with one another and, and people may not think, well, this, that's just not a spectacular experience worth sharing. I tell everybody that I know that you need to get a group of intimate friends around you to share things with, to bounce ideas off with. Fortunately for me, I've got a huge network of friends like that that I can turn to for advice. They can speak to me and they're good, godly Christian men. I'm, a, I'm not going to accept advice from anybody that's not. I may listen to somebody, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to take their advice but a godly Christian man that I know, yes, I will listen to them a little more intently, much like Eli recognized that God was speaking through Samuel and he told him, don't you hold anything back from me that God said, lest it happen to you. He was serious about what Samuel was fixing to tell him. And he conveyed a message to Samuel at the ripe old age of 12 years old that helped him immensely throughout his life. Well, how can we learn to hear God better than we do. Humble listening is both science and art. Eye contact, emotional engagement, comprehension, all contribute to listeners who truly understand. Because people are different in their experiences, their ability to communicate and limitations based on the biased interpretation of their own feelings. But as humble listeners, we see ourselves as servants teaching to truly understand one another's hearts and minds, you begin to listen and you begin to wonder, how come they responded that way? What in their life made them respond that way? What did they witness? What did they see? What did they hear? And as listeners, we begin to understand why certain people respond that way. And much like the story today, when Samuel tells Eli what God says, Eli does not get mad. He doesn't pull out a spear and kill the messenger. He compliments Samuel on telling him everything that God had said. And God is good. God is just. And may it be just as you have said. Samuel probably learned another valuable lesson from Eli that day. Is regardless of what God tells you, rejoice. Rejoice. Because he shows time and again how merciful and how good he is. And you say, well, how can he be merciful and just when he's going to kill two of Eli's sons? How can Eli, you know, take, take pride in that, take heart in that? Eli recognizes he did wrong and it's just a consequence for his sin. And he realizes that and he's probably going to act a little bit better going forward. And he certainly wants Samuel to act a little bit better going forward. He doesn't want him to suffer the same fate as Eli. And I'm sure Samuel doesn't want that either. So he's going to walk a little bit straighter line. He's going to listen more intently to what God says because of the mentoring here between Eli and Samuel. What is the most important way that God speaks to us? More than 40 men wrote the Bible, all of them using human letters, syllables, and words. In one sense, then, we should read the Bible as we read other books, applying the same laws of interpretation. The sentences in the the Bible are information and logical, and even children can understand them. But the Bible was also breathed out by God as its writers were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We must pray as Samuel does. Speak, Lord, for your service is listening. 
the most important way that God speaks to us is through the Bible. We've got to dust off the cover. We've got to open up the pages. We've got to read scripture because that is the most important way that God speaks to us. And no wonder we're in a nation in the condition that we're in today because we don't take time to read the Bible. We want to depend on someone else to read the Bible and interpret it for us and tell us how we should believe and tell us what God is saying. And believe me, you, I've heard enough people use Bible verses out of context that had nothing to do with the intended message because they used them out of context. They didn't tell the full story. And this is what's key today to Eli and Samuel's interchange that Samuel told the full story. He did not leave anything out. So if we're going to pick up on the nuances and the and the situations in the Bible of what uh, what we're going to read about, we need to read the full story. We need to read uh, why Eli's sons were not going to be allowed to be priests. They did unclean things with the food. They directly violated the uh, the rule set forth, but that God set forth about what was to be done with the food. They directly violated that. And Hophni and Phineas did not live to take over their dad's duties. And if we'll read in the Bible where God forbids or God um, hates or, or, or God thinks this or that about a certain situation, we will find out on our own how God thinks that this is abomination to him. And we won't do this anymore. But retail markets and, and certain fringe individuals cater to susceptible people today that don't read the Bible and they try to tell them one thing, that God loves everybody. Yes, yes, he does. And he wants you to follow his rules. And there's enough people getting punished in the Bible to know that we better follow his rules to the T. Because if we violate any of them, we risk condemnation and judgment by Christ. And we better believe that there's going to be that day when we all are judged by God. It's not going to be any man sitting on the throne. It'll be God. And make no mistake about it, that day is coming. What do we learn about God in this passage? Anyone who ever walked with the Lord never knows that he does not shout. He never raises his voice. It's a still and small voice that comes calling in the night. Samuel, Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Be a hearer, be a listener, and be a doer of God's word. As we uh, finish up today, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for joining us, but we've got a couple of things that are going on today. If you're looking for a church today, uh, Tap Methodist Church will be open at uh, 1030 to to noon for uh, for worship service and 915 to 1015 for Sunday school. But if you if you don't want to come here, just find a church. And uh, Red Bayou Methodist Church has got a special service going on today. Uh, they're north of Interstate on Highway 8, and they've got a homecoming service going on today. And a lot of people are coming back. Their singing starts at 1030. Their worship starts at 11 to 12. And uh, there'll be a, a potluck dinner afterwards uh if you want to go out there and take your family out there sure to be a grand occasion uh, as they're celebrating 160 plus years in ministry uh, but we thank y'all for joining us and we'll see y'all next week